Hello, Sales Nation. I am your host, Will Barron, and welcome to another episode of the Salesman Podcast. On this episode, we have Lee Ashton, and we're talking about NLP or Neuro Linguistic Programming. It's something that I have got a lot of value out of in the past. And yeah, Lee is uh, super clued up on it and she dives into the world of NLP and we apply it to sales specifically. So I've used it in the world of uh, self-help, personal development, that kind of thing. But it has massive uh, use in the world of sales, selling and just giving more value to prospects. So we cover that. You can find out more about Lee over at sales-consultancy.com. And just a quick apology from my side. We tried to get the show up at 9 a.m. GMT, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then it's a bit more varied on the other days. But today, it's Friday. It was up a bit late because I've been over at Bram Racing. Um, we've been doing some wheel geometry work, getting everything lined up on the RX-8 because we're going to be putting it on the track very soon. Very nice chap over there, a lad called Brad. Um, cheers, Brad. You spent a lot of time. You went out your way to help me and to go through some stuff with the car, which was awesome. So, yeah, I can highly recommend Bram Racing uh, or Bram Motorsport. Uh, and they're over in Yorkshire if you're in the UK. If you want any uh, car stuff doing, essentially, they're a garage and they also have got the Hunter wheel alignment system. So, with that said, and a little plug for them, let's jump into today's podcast. Hi, Lee, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Thank you very much, Will. I'm really happy to be here. Good stuff. And you're going to blow some minds here, as I just mentioned in pre-recording, because we're going to talk about sales mindset, we're going to talk about NLP. And let's start at the very basics here, the very beginning for anyone who hasn't come across NLP before, or people have heard the letters and the word, but have never quite understood what it what it's all about. Because I think that's potentially common as well. What does NLP stand for, Lee? Well, NLP is the shortened version of Neuro Linguistic Programming. And if you've never come across it before, it really is. uh, There'll be various, actually, uh, various descriptions of what NLP is. But it's all about how the mind works and the patterns and programming that we have as individuals that cause us to do behave, act out in a certain way. So NLP started in California in the 70s when they studied how come successful therapists are so successful, what makes them so much you know, head and shoulders above the normal conventional therapist. And and in that study, what they found that it wasn't just the behaviours that those individuals did that made them so outstanding. It was what they were thinking alongside doing the actions. And what was remarkable was that when they replicated that thinking and those actions, these people who were doing this study found that they could get the same results as those therapists with no formal therapeutic training. So that was how it started. It started very much as a modelling excellence study I guess for students and a lecturer in that university and it was Richard Bandler and John Grinder that um, that sparked this whole thing which is neuro-linguistic programming and NLP and 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 when I came across it some 20 years ago one of the things that really dawned on me was what a perfect marriage for any individual in a sales role. Because to understand how your own mind works and to understand how your customer's mind works just makes for a great experience for both sides. Definitely. And I'm intrigued here, Lee, how did you come across it and how did you get more involved in it? Wow. Or or perhaps the better question is why? Okay. What did it pull on in your brain when you noticed it? Well, I went into sales by accident and uh, I just, mm, I went for an interview for a job, a sales job, Mm -hmm. and I was working in finance because somebody said, you know, I think you'd be really good at sales. And I went, no way, you know, that's not me. And I pondered on it. And a week later said, well, I'm going to go for an interview. And if I get the job, I know that that 
is what I'm meant to be doing. And that is exactly what happened. So I was naturally good at sales. I didn't really know what I was doing, Will, because I just, I'm really interested in people and fixing people's problems, which is... <laughs> now I know is an essential ingredient to being good at sales. Back then, I was very green and naive. And I just talked with people and was really good at sales. So that was great. I had a fantastic start to my career. And then they promoted me to a sales manager. And that's when I really, well, I started to feel inadequate, frustrated, simply third camp was that would never work for me or my customers so I just couldn't figure out why on earth a person wouldn't do something that had been so successful for someone they knew had been successful so that led me down the path of reading books and back then it was cassettes you know I used to go on Nightingale Conan and buy cassettes and do lots of personal development and in the process of that I uh, came across Tony Robbins who is like the I suppose really has brought NLP into a more um, public awareness although he doesn't call it that. And I started to read things about the mind. And then quite remarkably, I went to a networking event and I met an NLP trainer who had a, a training school over here in the UK. And at that time, there weren't that many, you know, many people were going over to the States for their NLP training and, and this particular organization had got all their qualifications out in the States. And so uh, I met this person, I did an NLP practitioner, absolutely loved it, did the master practitioner, then went on and did other NLP qualifications. And then uh, when I started my business, realized that what goes on between the ears has the biggest impact and wanted to share that with people out there, whether they were a salesperson, a sales manager, a business owner, you know, it's very, when you think about sales in a different way, it becomes much more enjoyable. So this is what I want to dive into. You mentioned then, and you also mentioned it right at the beginning of the show, that there's patterns, there's things that go on in your brain that you are perhaps not conscious that you're receiving and that mm. going in there, but make a massive difference to how you live your life day to day. Mm. If you had to put a number on it, and I don't know if this has ever actually been studied, but if you had to put a number on it from your personal experience, how much of an average person's day to day activity do you think is just autopilot? And it's things that they are not conscious and not in control of. That they just do without thinking. Well, 95% of what we do is unconscious. So we only become conscious when something out of the ordinary happens or when we are learning. When we are learning, we have to go conscious to learn because we're taking in information. But during the course of the day... If you're not doing anything different that causes you to step into that conscious state, then everything happens without you thinking about it. You lift your uh, glass of water to your lips without actually thinking about it. You um, blink and breathe and look and think in a way that is completely unconscious. And, and my analogy for that is the iceberg. You know, there's a small amount of the tip of the iceberg that's above the waterline most of an iceberg in fact nine tenths of an iceberg is below the level of the waterline so I think that that's what a human being is like so I think that five percent is 
conscious so at the moment uh, you know if you're listening to this podcast you'll be conscious of my voice and you might be conscious of anything that you write down in the moment any ideas that you get you'll be conscious of will's voice and uh, everything else will be going on around you without you even thinking about it and does this go can you scale that up to day-to-day things, for example? And I'll, I'll give you the example rather than trying to give you a leading question, but I had a guest on the other day and he, super simple idea, but it blew my mind. I've never thought about this before. He suggested that the audience and I just write down the objections that we get from customers when, when we're selling. Mm. Obviously, there's a, you can then leverage that in such a way that if there's a common objection, it's likely that your response to that is the same response. And so does all this, what you're saying, scale up from uh, lifting a cup of tea up to your mouth? Does it scale up to the point where if you get asked that, or if you are given the same objection in sales, until you stop and think about it, you're likely to give the same response every time, like verbatim. Yeah. Yeah, that that is absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And that's the sad part about it. If your strategy, if your unconscious behavior is an effective one and it gets you the result that you want, you're doing it unconsciously and it works, so it's great. But what (laughs) often happens is if your response is not effective, if you're not getting the result that you want, most people will continue to do that because it's a habit. And what isn't happening is that going into conscious state and saying, okay, so what could I have done differently that would have got a better result? So that salesperson, for example, could leave that meeting or put that phone down and think, God, that person was really difficult. I was never going to sell to them and come up with a whole host of reasons and excuses that make them think that the problem is something else. And actually, the problem is our reaction to what somebody says or their reaction to what we say. And is that the default response because you're trying to protect your own ego or your own confidence by blaming it on something else? Oh, absolutely. You know, if it's not your fault, then it lets you off the hook. The other thing, though, that if you blame something else or someone else outside of you, you're giving your personal power to that person Mm -hmm. or that situation and that actually puts you in victim mode and when you're in victim mode you cannot be resourceful enough to use all the tools in your armory all the tools in your sales toolkit because part of you is thinking well there's no point because I can't do anything about that we're diving deeper into uh, into the sales mindset now which is what I want to do Mm. And there's two routes that we can go down. And I think we'll have to have you back on for a second show to (laughs) dive into. And tell me if I'm wrong here, but it seems like you can use NLP on yourself to improve the way that you perform. Mm. But is it also possible to use NLP to understand other people and then sell more efficiently to them as well? Absolutely. Because if you understand the person that you're interacting with at a deeper level, it means that you have a much clearer understanding of what they really want and need. And when you know that, it means that you can tailor your approach to deliver your solutions in a way that that person thinks that's exactly what I need. Okay, right. We're going to save that for another show Mm. because that is a whole show in itself Mm. for sure. And I want to come back to the, the person listening to this now. Is there a, because we're not really talking about NLP techniques or the, the, the language side of things, is there a huge bang for book way of getting the most out of everything that NLP offers in the shortest amount of time that could be demonstrated over a podcast for a listener to, I guess, the common problems that salespeople have or a lack of confidence in themselves or the product that they're selling or a, a fear of success or a fear of failure? Is there any 
anything that NLP can do with one of those specifically that we can go through and, and showcase it in this podcast? Yes, there is. There is something that I share whenever I work with any individual or any group that well, I, I guess there's a few things that I always share. This one is so simple. And I, I, for me, it's the starting point. If you are, let me ask, let me ask a question, Will. If you think okay. about something that you really love to do, that you know that you are good at, when you think about that thing, whatever it is, what kind of a feeling do you get inside uh, a a warm feeling yeah. in my like chest kind of like heart area okay so and <laughs> for for if for those of you listening whatever that feeling is for you just acknowledge what that feeling is now when we are doing something that we love and we enjoy and we're good at we always generate a positive feeling, but there is a thought immediately before that feeling that is what I call the trigger thought that generates that feeling. And sometimes we know what it is, and sometimes we have absolutely no idea because it's unconscious. But it could be along the lines of, I'm really looking forward to this, this is going to be great, or something along those lines that then triggers that feeling and then when your thoughts and feelings are in alignment, it's like every cell of your body wants to do that thing, whatever it is. And because you are so laser focused, because all of you wants to do it, the action that you take is a really great action. It's laser focus. It's, there's 100% commitment to that action. And then you get a result that is a really good result. So it's like T for thoughts, F for feelings, A for actions, and then R for results. So TFAR is a concept that is hugely, hugely powerful. And so now if you scrub that and think of something in sales that you don't like doing, something that you would avoid if you could. And maybe <laughs> you've become well practiced at avoiding it so that you hardly ever have to do it. You know that you don't like it. You know you're not that great at it. And when you think of that activity, just notice what feelings come up for you inside. Well, for me, Lee, that activity is I'll have done research on like prospects and potential partners for the, the podcast and the, and the blog and everything that we do. The thing I dread, or not, I, I don't particularly, I don't dread it, but I dislike it versus the rest of the sales process is that initial email reach out to try and set up a phone call. Because it's to me, it's dead laborious and you have to obviously focus and you're writing and you, it's difficult to put, I find it's difficult sometimes to put across how excited you are in that email and all that kind of thing. And as you were describing that, both I got a feeling inside of like heaviness, mm -hmm. But also, I could, I was, I was noticed my face went from having a massive grin <laughs> to uh, almost frowning, and I slumped over my seat as well. I was a bit like, Ugh. yeah. That's that's probably how I was feeling in in a word that uh, probably isn't in the dictionary. Blur. Yeah. So so, I mean, you use the word dread, and you went, well, not actually dread, but that was the word that initially came up for you. So it could be that the thought that triggered that negative feeling is, oh, no, not this again, or, oh, I really don't want to do this, or I can't yeah. get my enthusiasm across on an email. So when there is something we don't want to do, our thoughts and feelings are out of alignment because we know that we have to do this in order to increase our sales and yet every cell in our body doesn't want to and it creates a tension a bit like an elastic band and it's pulling in one direction and in the other direction so it's pulling both ways and what that means is it's impossible to do a laser focused action because your energy is going in all directions rather than into that commitment to do that action. And because you've got a negative thought, 
you've created a negative feeling which then creates a mediocre action at best and then the result is not what you want which then reinforces the thought that you don't want to do this or you're not good at this so whenever you notice that negative feeling inside ask yourself what's the trigger thought that is creating this negativity and then once you've worked out what that is and if you're not 100 percent sure just guess you know what could it be um and when you've got that ask yourself what could i think instead and is it as simple as that it's because... simple as that so let me ask <laughs> you will let me ask you yeah because there's always more than one perspective. Our thoughts are actually created from the perspective that we view it from at that moment. But are there other perspectives? Yeah, of course there are. You know, if you stand watching a situation from one side, you won't get what somebody else sees from the other side. You get similar things, but you you know there's more than one perspective always, which is if you take the example of sending a text message to somebody that's fairly innocent, fairly passive, and then they get on the phone and they're going crazy because they think that you've said something that's insulting. And you go, gosh, you know, I didn't mean it like that at all. So we've all had an experience of either being on the receiving end of a text message that drives us nuts or being on the receiving end of a call where you've driven somebody else nuts and the intention was not that so there's always more than one perspective and so if you know that your mind has created that perspective it means that your mind can stand in a different position and create another uh, um, perspective so I'll give you an example people who hate picking up the phone um, I and when I ask them what thoughts could be trigger t triggering their negative feelings on the phone to pick up the phone, they'll say, "Oh, they could say no. People don't really want to hear from me. You know, they get a million phone calls a day from salespeople." Yeah. And I say, "Okay, so what could you think instead?" And they say, "Well, this could be the start of a beautiful relationship. Actually, they if I don't call them and tell them about." what we do they will never know and they could never benefit actually this person could really want to hear and so, and the other thing is you could say well actually whatever happens whether they're interested or not i'm going to make it a nice experience mm -hmm. okay lee i want to i want to come back i want to be selfish here and come back to the example that i gave because there's a couple of things as i'm scribbling them down here i i totally perhaps consciously but not unconsciously understand that until i send these emails and again i don't hate doing it mm. but i don't I, I do dislike this step of the sales cycle mm. because i love closing i love having the conversations on the phone yeah. and meeting people and people people in person so i do dislike this step but i understand consciously this step has to happen for the rest of it to happen mm. and so once i've done say two or three emails and if the goal is five or six depending on what we're doing then once i've done that initial few i feel okay and i start to get in a bit of a rhythm and a flow but you mentioned these words specifically before of i feel like i have to do this mm. versus the rest of the sales process i feel like i want to do mm. it so is this do i just need to keep telling me to get over this because it is a barrier and other people will be listening and whether it's as you said picking up the phone and chatting to people or whether it's the prospecting side of things People listening will ha will be saying, I, I, hand in, I'll be hand in the air going, yeah, I know, I've got this same block in some other pro part of the, the sales process and I just don't enjoy doing it and it, it, it blocks my funnel up then because there's not enough coming in or not enough leads getting past this stage. Do I and the audience need to be just reaffirming the story that we're telling ourselves that it's a positive thing and just going over this over and over and over or is the... A, a hack or a, a quicker way to reprogram that part of my brain uh, i think if you notice any negative feeling you have to change the thought so <clears throat> you just have to come up with a thought that 
you relate to you know what you said is absolutely right when you have to do something when you're being forced to do something even if you are forcing yourself to do something it never is a good space to be because it means that you have no perception of choice so change the choice you said that when you start to make these um do these emails you know that when you get into flow it's okay So the choice is, do I do six or ten today? Do I feel better after two or do I feel better after three today? Mm -hmm. So give yourself that choice, but make sure that the choice is okay either way. You already have said that actually I get into flow once I've done it. So telling yourself actually the first two are just my first step to getting into flow. This is brilliant. All right. So what blows my mind about this is it's like trying to convince a child to do something that they don't <laughs> want to do, but that you know that, that you need them to do it. Mm. So I'm going to go really deep here, Lee, for a second. Mm. And obviously you've got your uh, subconscious or unconscious and different people label them different ways mm. for different things. And you, But you've got, the, you've got your conscious and you've got this other thing. Mm. Which one of them is you and y- you as the, the person? Because I feel like in this conversation now, I am my conscious brain trying to convince my unconscious to do something and they're kind of like a big brother or something that's really in control, if that makes sense. Mm. That's a poor analogy, but which one of these is actually you or are are they just both you in different parts? They're both you, but you're right in your um, analogy that your unconscious or subconscious or whatever you call it um that part of your mind has all the power and if you think about it as a place where everything lives that controls what you say and what you do so there's a part of you the ego part that also lives in that unconscious part and that's all about saying the right things and doing the right things Mm -hmm. so I, I think there are many parts of you I think there are many parts of you that impact on the person that you are and one of the um five keys to success is awareness the more awareness you get around the different parts of you the more you are able to lead a peaceful and successful life. So all of us are, you know, I call it light and dark. We all have our really positive and um, outgoing and nice part of us. But we also have this dark, the bits that we don't like about ourselves. And it's a balance. None of us are perfect. And when we attack um, others, and I don't mean physically, but maybe verbally or even in your own mind, when you attack other people for being X, then hold the mirror up. Because things that generally annoy us are things that can, you know, are in us. And so if a customer annoys you or another sales colleague annoys you or your sales manager annoys you or your sales director annoys you and you think, God, that person's such a whatever, um, then ask yourself, where do you do that thing? Because that's when I say we're many parts, we're parts that we know and where parts that we don't know for example I know that I really care about people and I know that I'm a very kind person but I know that sometimes I can be a real pain in the ass (laughs) and I can be selfish so um, it's about acknowledging those parts of ourselves that we are that actually means okay so what does selfish mean to me in a positive way it means that actually When I'm focused on something, I'm really focused and I get it done. I don't let other people distract me and I don't let other people get in the way. Um, And I, you know, if there's a particular job 
that needs to be done and I'm the person to do it for the good of the team and the company, then I will like, you know, I'll say, I'm sorry, I can't meet you for dinner. I can't go and visit this person. I can't go and visit that person because I need to get this done. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, I, this is a concept that I thought about a lot and I've never really understood it. And it, it confuses me of that. If you see, and this is a massive stereotype, it's probably not a, a positive one and it's probably uh, not a good thing to say, but if you see a person walking down the street talking to themselves, you think they're crazy. Yeah. But then you speak to a CEO in a in a big company, whether you're selling to them or your your mates with them or the mentoring you or whatever the case may be, you're speaking to them and they will then be talking to themselves in their own head and justifying things. And when it, when it's in your head, it's fine. But when it's not in your head, it's, it's you're crazy. And, mm. and with that, Lee, I, I, you wrapped that up nicely. And I, I've got a couple of show. I've got a couple of questions that I ask everyone that comes on the show. Mm. Um, so I want to dive into these before you tell us a little bit about your book and also the speaking you do as well. Because mm. I know a lot of sales managers listen to the show, and uh, they would be they'd be getting a lot of value out of having you come and speak with them at their organisation, especially if they're in the UK. And with that, Lee, a couple of questions. First one: Who do you think is the world's greatest salesperson? Oh gosh i don't know that i can even answer that um <laughs> there are people that i really respect in the personal development world who i mean you know tony robbins is a great salesperson for sure yeah definitely um he's awesome but it depends in what context you mean, because, you know, I think that there are so many salespeople in the in organisations around the world doing an amazing job. We won't know their names, but they're like the number one salesperson maybe in their company or actually they could be the third most successful salesperson in their company but as an all-rounder salesperson that really cares about their customer they could be the greatest so for me that's a really if you're talking about selling from stage tony robbins absolutely comes to mind but for me to I think it's every unsung hero in a company that is really a fantastic ambassador for their business. Do you know what, Lee? So I leave that question totally open-ended to get a different response and angle from each of the guests that come on the show. Mm. Most people go with Steve Jobs or um, Nelson Mandela mm. or someone who's got a positive message, who's got it out there and has been a good storyteller. Mm. But... You've mentioned a few times in the show that you care about people and individuals. And so the context of your answer of the individual salesperson, which comes up very rarely, is is an insight that I find fascinating there. And it just showed that you obviously you do think and care about the, the individuals, which is obviously super important in what you're doing. Mm. And that, I think that was good. And next question and final one for me, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one bit of advice you'd give her to help her become better at sales? Oh, I would say dream big and just go for it. So do you think, because I believe this, and other people have said it to me who are way, way beyond me on the sales and entrepreneurial like path and journey, do you think that most people look back and think that, if they would have set bigger targets, they would have achieved them. Oh, I in, absolutely. In, in hindsight, yeah, no, I absolutely. I mean, I've I've always been quite competitive by nature, so it was always, you know, if a company, um, when I was in the corporate world, set me a target, there was no way that I wasn't going to achieve that <laughs> target. So, so in that respect, I've always been driven by achievement. Um, and I've always found sales quite easy. But whenever I'm doing something outside my comfort zone or something new, um, I think that back then I used to just hesitate a little bit. But, you know, when you start to learn a, about how the mind works, you know that hesitation 
is just a bit of uncertainty and it's okay to feel a bit uncertain if it's something that yeah. you've never done before and just recognizing that that's okay fantastic well uncertainty is just a sign that you're progressing i mm. guess and growing yeah if you don't push yourself well frankly if you don't push yourself no one's going to do it for you people want you to be comfortable people generally don't want you to be surpassing everyone else and, and diving forward so and this is what i've got out of our show today uh, as well lee is that you've really just got to get on with this yourself it's the stories that you tell yourself that determine how and what you're going to do in your life and yeah just to wrap it up from that then that you you can set your own goals and you can tell yourself the story that you're going to achieve it and then you're set on that path then which is which is fantastic yeah you know there's only one person in control of your results and that's you and and so if the more you focus on your own personal development you know I'm not saying forget the sales techniques. We all need techniques. But my experience when I've gone into organizations to deliver sales training is every salesperson in that room knows what they should be doing. <laughs> they just aren't doing it. You yeah. know, we all know that. Or, and, you know, and if we're completely honest, there are always things that we don't do that we know would really help us. And it's about taking the first step outside of your comfort zone and knowing that that isn't the terror zone, it's the learning zone. You know, you're Brilliant. stepping into the learning zone. Brilliant. And Lee, with that, I want you to tell us a little bit about your book and then tell us a little bit about the speaking that you do as well. Super. Um, my book, I Sell, is all about having a winning sales mindset. And when I sat down to uh, create that book, I wrote it to a particular person that I, I know uh, who um, had certain struggles around sales and I wrote that book for them and it's written in a way that talks to you and it's um, got lots of exercises and it's designed as a step-by-step -step process to get you from any negativity in sales to realizing that actually sales is all about serving the other person and really caring about them and actually also really caring about yourself. So um, the first nine chapters are specifically written for salespeople and business owners and the final chapter is written uh, for specifically for people who manage a sales team to how they can use all those psychological um, concepts to support develop and manage their team to greater sales success and i mean it was a joy writing it and it's been a joy since i wrote it having people tell me it's been their sales bible because <laughs> that you can once you've read it you can dip in and out uh, amazing so so that's the book and speaking i kind of speak in all at all different kinds of um occasions conferences and big events that are sp specifically around sales so uh, actually when it comes to sales and the psychology of I can talk for hours you know my biggest challenge is actually making it fit into a very <laughs> short period of time so you just tell set me in the direction of the objective you want for this for the talk and you know I'll go so that's me Amazing stuff. And you can find out more about you over at sales-consultancy.com. Okay. The book's available on Amazon. And we'll link to all that and some blog posts from your site over in the show notes at salesman.red. And with that, Lee, I just want to thank you again for your time. And I want to thank you for coming on the Salesman podcast. Thank you very much. It's been a blast. Thanks, Will. And there we have it. I just want to thank Lee again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, there's a lot more to go here, so we'll definitely have Lee back on the show in the future. You can find out more about her over at sales-consultancy.com. And with that, I will speak to you guys again tomorrow. <laughs>